Hi everyone, I'm Fanola Howard from How Great Marketing Works and today I have another expert for our expert panel to introduce you to today. And his name is Robert Leslie and he's from a company called Satichi that he founded. In fact, the reason that we have Rob Leslie on our expert panel is because of his vast, you love this, vast experience in the tech sector, in the startup sector of what it takes to make a company work from concept to idea to early discussions with partners or just going it alone because he's co-founded two very very successful companies one called kicker which is now quoted on the australian stock exchange and now we have sudici which is an award-winning international award-winning technology company in the identity space and we are very honored to have him here today so hi rob welcome hi finola how are you i'm very good i'm very good do you want to give us, it's quite an interesting journey and this is one of the reasons why I really wanted you to have, have you on the panel because you know the journey. And I think it's really important for people to understand what it takes, what this journey takes. So let me, I, I'm gonna ask you to do a little intro for yourself from your own perspective. Sure. Please. So, uh, hi everyone, I'm Rob. Um, I'm an engineer. Uh, I graduated in the 80s. I left Ireland. I went to live in Japan for, for nearly 20 years. Um, worked for a number of Japanese companies, a number of American companies, had my own business, sold my own business um, right at the peak of the, uh, the internet bubble, the first one that we had. Um, there was nothing more than serendipity involved in that. Happened to be in the right place at the right time. There was no... Um, we had a wonderful product that was massively in in um in demand um it wasn't like that at all we had a business that was growing and somebody wanted an entry into the japanese market we happened to be in the right place at the right time we said come on let's take the money and run pretty much um Love it. um came back to ireland in 2003 um sort of recharged the batteries for a number of years and then um with a colleague of mine, we founded um, Kicker. It wasn't called Kicker at the time. Um, no. It had a much longer uh, name called Global Business Register. And the idea around um, Kicker as it is now was to build um, a single network that allow, would allow any uh, business anywhere in the world to look up the bona fides of, of a supplier, a customer, um, so that you could establish um, that they really were who you thought they were um, and do it quickly and easily. Um, and today, um, Kicker's network would extend to, I don't know, roughly 250 different business registries around the world. Um, it's used by banks, other financial institutions, um, um, you know, everywhere. Uh, and as Fanon said, is listed on the stock exchange in Australia. Uh, I have no day-to-day -day involvement with uh, with Kicker anymore, other than I still have a shareholding in it. Um, um, hopefully, you know, it might contribute to my pension one day, but um, uh, no, no day-to-day -day involvement. But it was in the course of the Kicker business that I realised that identity was going to be a very important part of the whole digital um, journey because um, we don't get to meet people anymore. Uh, we we sit on the other side of a computer um, and we look at somebody through a camera and it's actually getting to the point now where we look at somebody and we have to ask ourselves, is the person we're looking at really that person? Yeah. Um, the technology has got to the point where I could deep fake Finola, who I'm looking at on my screen, um, and it would be quite convincing um, what I was looking at. So being able to establish that you are dealing with or talking to the person you think you're talking to is, is going to be really, really important. Um, also, does, just a quick question around that, because we've just done an interview with another panel expert, um, Philippa Jane Farley, who's in the, uh, the data privacy space. Does it make identity even tougher to prove because of our protecting our own data? Well, when I started um, Sadichi back in 2013, um, privacy was one of the angles that I was pushing. And I remember sitting in a, in a VC's, a venture capitalist's office in Silicon Valley, 
giving my pitch and he leaned back in his chair, put his hands behind his head and basically said, Rob, he said, my advice to you is to give up and go home. Nobody cares. Um, privacy is dead. People are giving away all their information. Um, they're going to always give away all their information. Um, it's not going to change. So your business isn't really a business at all. Um, no, interesting. How no, did you react? Did you just write him off? or? Well, my response was at that point, I knew I wasn't going to get any money out of him. So I could speak yeah. freely um, <laughs> and basically said, you're wrong. Um, and I'll tell you why you're wrong. And uh, what I basically said to him was, you know, privacy is like insurance. You don't know you need it until after you need it. Um, and I said, there will be a catastrophic event, either single or multiple, where people suddenly realize that they have been damaged in some way. And um, if they had been a little bit more careful with how their information was contributed or given or managed, um, it wouldn't have happened. Now, we've all seen over the last mm. you know, X number of years, all the data breaches that have taken place. We've seen how data can be misused with Cambridge Analytica and how you know, democratic processes can be uh, corrupted through the misuse of data. Mm -hmm. and the vast majority of people have no clue um, or understanding as to how they can be manipulated. Um, you know, I, I use my mother as, as, as a, you know, a willing guinea pig when I, when I explain this, is in that she will read something and it'll immediately resonate with her. And immediately she'll pump that out to, you know, 30 of her friends um, to say, yes, I absolutely agree with this. And then I'll tell her that that's fake news. It, it's not true. And she'll go, how could it possibly not be true? It sounds true. Um, it sounds true because you want it to sound true. That doesn't make it true. Um, and one of the biggest challenges I think we're going to see over the next two, three, five years is trying to distill the truth from non-truth. Um, and identity is going to play a really important part of that because the attribution of things, um, who, who wrote them, where did they come from, can I prove the source of this, uh, is going to be critically important in, in, in all of this. So we've been looking at for the last number of years, how can we use technology to do all these things when it comes to proving who somebody or a thing or a company is, um, while still preserving their rights to privacy and confidentiality. Mm. Um, and we've developed some very cool cryptography that essentially allows people and organizations to mutually prove things to each other without them having to share them. So, I could prove to you, for example, that my name is Rob without telling you my name is Rob. Um, uh, and the proof is mathematically sound. Um, and I can I like prove that, that it's sound. I like that about what Sadichi is doing, that we don't need to, to give away all our data, to violate all our privacy or be, you know, to give away everything in order to prove who we are. That's like wonderful what the Sadichi is doing. Yeah, so, you know, you exist in potentially hundreds of places on the web. Mm. Um, some of those places are highly trustworthy and some of them are less so. Um, and some of them definitely are completely untrustworthy, probably. Um, and I put social media into that last category um, because it is a cesspit of um, truth and complete untruth um, with stuff that you have no idea where it came from to other stuff that is highly reliable um, and and trustworthy. But we have no mechanism today to be able to distill that and filter it. I mean, if I had a filter on my browser to say, get rid of all of the rubbish, I would have that on all the time to be able to figure out, well, this came from a real person, not a bot. Um, or um, this person has a very trusted following of real people. Um, therefore, I'm going to trust them as well. So, you know, these mechanisms are some of the things that we're looking at. And the way to do that is to build essentially a network of organizations that allow you to connect and verify things um, between, it could be governments, it could be highly trusted organizations like, you know, utilities, telcos, uh, people, banks, people who you implicitly trust. Now, a lot of people will say when I say, you know, trust a bank, uh, 
um, you got to be cracked. But you still give them your money. In fact, you probably give them all your money. Therefore, you do trust them with some of the most important things in your life. Um, whether they make the right decisions or not from a business perspective is a different challenge. Mm. The fundamental question, do you trust them with your money, is always yes, because they always give it back to you. Yeah. Always. It is the fundamental premise of a business. Now, this is a piece of advice for, 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 for anybody who's starting a business. Trust is critical. You've got to establish trust with your customers. And it can take years and years and years to establish it. And it can be lost in a second. Mm. So you've got to be very, very careful with um, how you manage that relationship um, and not put anything um, in place that could potentially damage it or um, corrupt it in some way because it, you and may also, never recover. We also have to acknowledge, I suppose what you are trying to share with us is how can we show we can be trusted as well, but also we can still be, we can still make mistakes and still be trusted. Absolutely. Yeah. It's okay to make a mistake, yes. um, but be honest about it. Yes. You know, um, you know, Microsoft screwed up this week. Um, they, they had a problem with um, uh, Internet Explorer, um, with what's known as a, um, a zero-day um, flaw, um, which meant it could be hacked. The first thing they do, did was they went public. They don't have a fix for it yet. Now, it meant people were aware that there is a problem. Maybe don't use the browser until this flaw has been fixed. Yeah. So they can help themselves. But in my view, Microsoft did everybody a massive favor and themselves a favor by telling the world this problem existed. Whereas there would have been other organizations potentially who would have said, oh, we can't tell anybody. We've got to hide this because we will look weak because we had a, a, a flawed product. Um, on the contrary, I think it's a sign of strength to be able to show that you have weaknesses, that you're not perfect, um, but you're okay. still working hard to, to address them. Really good lesson to underline because, you know, as, a, as an entrepreneur, often we are always in danger of trying to be perfect, trying to, see, to, to be seen to have everything right. But it's okay. It's all this question of this much overused term authenticity and all of that. But again, I know we're talking about the technology and privacy and stuff, but I still think there are underlying messages in what you're saying that affect our behavior as entrepreneurs, that we can, as you said so wonderfully, which is being open, being upfront, showing, showing that you've made a mistake, but are upfront about it is a sign of strength, not weakness. I just wanted to reiterate that. Absolutely. And I go even further. It's a sign of strength to ask for help. You know, it's, it's, it's not a weakness. Uh, it's like I'm drowning under all of the things I have to do. I need help. Um, to say you need help is the first um, thing that you have to do in addressing the problem. Um, generally, when you say to somebody, I need help, the first thing they'll do is, what can I do to help? Um, now, they may not be able to, but at least you've addressed the first challenge, which is uh, at least get it out there that you're failing in something that you need help with. Um, well, again, wonderful lesson. I always love talking to you. I even, it's not always, sometimes when you're asking for help, it's not always that you're drowning. It just may, may mean that you don't have that skill set or that knowledge that somebody else has that could solve, could rest, put your mind at ease quicker. And I know this because I spoke to Rob about, two months ago about a potential contract that I was about to sign. And I asked for his advice, would you sign this? And he went, no, and I didn't. <laughs> so really good. Yeah. Because it's not always when we're desperate. Sometimes it's about, I just need a piece of information or something to help me bring me to the next stage. It's actually why I built this program for the ability to ask for help. Absolutely. And again, I, I come back to it. You can't be all things all the time to mm. all people. I mean, there's nobody who can do that. So why do people expect that? Um, and we expect it of ourselves, which is a, an unrealistic expectation. Um, I mean, I'm good at certain things. I know what I'm good at. I equally know what I'm not good at. And being able to 
um, identify when those traits are coming to the fore um, and do something about it is, I think is really important. It's and it's a real strength. Um, and I know that about myself um, when I need help with something. This is probably a good time to ask you, when is it a good time for someone who signed up for the Get Strategic Programme to come to you for help? Well, when you realize that there may be something beyond your, your capability and you haven't figured out how to solve it, um, you know, that's a good time to have a chat with somebody. Um, you know, it, it could be, you know, it could be strategy related. It could be product related. It could be um, marketing. It could be personnel. Um, I mean, I'll give you an example. I mean, I'm, I'm part of a, um, a group of uh, startups um, that uh, get together once every couple of months. The CEOs get together. The rules are um, you can talk about whatever you want, but whatever is talked about stays within the room. And it's almost a psych session um, where some people come and go, I'm, I'm, I, I'm giving up. I can't do it anymore. Um, and then generally leave going, wow, okay, we solved that. Um, <laughs> Great. What? Wh- because the other CEOs are, are sort of a sounding board for, um, for the problem. And it just is a stream of consciousness that tries to put out, you know, lots of ideas, um, thoughts, um, that the, the, the problem, uh, the person who has the problem can either take on board or discard. And generally, there's so many ideas coming that you're going to find one that actually could address, could address it. Um, you know, there was, you know, I'm not going to mention any names, but there was one person who was just a really bad organizer. Um, he just couldn't organize his life, yet he was running a really successful business. Mm. And I said, well, the suggestion was, well, why don't you get an assistant and let her organize your life and you do what you're really good at, which is building your business. Mm. And that's exactly what he did. The next time he came back two months later, he was in a much happier place um, because he wasn't worrying about all of the stuff that he wasn't doing and paying attention to. He was now doing the things that he was really good at and his assistant was managing his life. So she was telling him where to be. Um, I'm just saying she, cause it was a she, um, but it could equally be a he. Um, and she, she did all of that for him um, and just took away all that stress and hassle cause he was no good at it. And you could see why and, it was no good. And it's okay to be no good at it. It's okay to yeah. be no good at some stuff. And then you feel that you, as you said rightly, spend the time on the stuff that you're great at. Exactly. Yeah. Great. So in a nutshell, I suppose, I think if I was advising someone to speak to Rob, it would be, you could be in the technology sector. It doesn't have to be. It can be. It's a time to speak to someone who's been there before you. I think that... You, I mean, I specifically chose people on this panel that had a connected view of things. But I think, Rob, you are one that has a a very deeply practical view and connected view because you've done it. So let me maybe just give a few thoughts as to why, um, you know, when when someone has a a challenge or whatever, they they might want to just ping me an email or or pick up the phone. this is my oh, seventh or eighth startup, some of which mm. I have um, done myself, uh, some of which I have done for others. Mm. Um, I have only failed miserably with one. Great. And I learned a lot from that. Um, generally, what I would say is that the startup, the startup founder's journey is a very lonely one. And you bear a lot of um, lashes uh, along the way when, you know, you're running out of money and you've got bills to pay and, you know, HR issues all over the place. The customers are shouting at you. You know, all of these things can accumulate to the point where, you know, you, you just go home in the evening and you go, I can't take it anymore. That's the point where you need to talk to somebody. Um, and generally it'll be, well, okay, you've got these 10 problems. Let's see if we can prioritize them. Um, what really matters? Well, we got to pay the bills. Well, okay. Where's the money coming from? Well, we're due to get paid by, and we start to work it out. Um, and you end up with a, a series of 
probably small actions that um, can be done pretty quickly that will have an immediate effect. Generating a little bit of success can suddenly create a pathway through the murk um, mm. that allows you to see your way out. Now, w- one of the things that I would say to, to any startup founder, this is a persistence game. Um, it, it's about lasting the course. And one of my pet hates is this phrase, fail fast. My, I hate it. And the reason why I hate it is because it is anathema to a startup founder to fail. They don't want to fail. Mm. What, you, what you're really trying to encourage them is to succeed and figure out whatever it takes to succeed. It's the venture capitalist that really wants you to fail fast because um, he, he doesn't want to waste time on uh, a business that's going nowhere. But that is not the founder mentality. The founder's mentality is I want to succeed. And how can persistence, I do- exactly. But how to do that? Persistence is the name of the game. And that's all about problem solving. Um, You've got to figure out solutions to problems. And sometimes you may not come up with those solutions yourself. Talking to somebody just might help you to do that. And I'm happy to, you know, chat with anybody who just needs a sounding board for whatever it is. Um, I mean, I generally say to people, um, you can take what I, what I say to you with a pinch of salt. Um, I will not be offended in any way if you don't decide uh, to, to use um, what, I, what I say to you. Um, but I'll know that you will get some benefit out of the conversation for sure, because I know I have, having had similar conversations with you know, similar founders like me. Um, I, I, I value those contributions because we're all peers um, and we all know the pain. So it's a sort of shared, um, uh, shared experience uh, yeah. in, in many ways. Yeah, wonderful. Very well put. So three tips for entrepreneurs amongst all the value you've just given. <laughs> so even if you want to wrap it. Um, well, the, the, I suppose I'm, I've already mentioned persistence. It's persistence, 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 persistence. Do not give up. Um, look at I agree just to say I agree wholeheartedly it is absolutely a persistence game keep your nose down keep focused when, yeah. when you think it's all over come back and have another go at it and see right what what is there there is there a, a gem of something that I could tweak in some way come at it a different way go to somebody for a little bit of help um, and you know whether it's a money issue a personnel issue whatever um, don't give up until it's absolutely, absolutely, absolutely the last possible thing. The second thing is look after your health. If your health goes, you are screwed. Um, um, you know, to put it in, in you know, a really not so fine manner, um, you, you've got to make sure you stay healthy, um, both physically and mentally. Um, I, I find that uh, I'm not very good at this myself. Um, in that I, I, I spend too long um, on, on planes, you know, thinking that I can get away with four hours of sleep for three, four, five, six days on a row. And it, it just accumulates. When I was, you know, 20 something, 30 something, I'd get away with it, but I'm not getting away with it anymore. Um, it just makes you drained and tired. And when you're drained and tired, you make bad decisions. Yeah. Um, so look after your health. And then the third thing is communication. Um, communicate to all those people who you need to communicate with and do it regularly. Um, You'll find that your investors, your shareholders, your colleagues um, will appreciate open and frank discussions. Um, People naturally get suspicious when silence happens. Um, Whether it's an investor going, he hasn't spoken to me for six months. Um, There must be something wrong. Um, there might not be, but every two months I send out, for example, a, an investor update to all our investors and in it, I'll cover off the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, so they get everything. And when they get it all in small doses, they're all, you know, generally seasoned business people themselves. Um, they know that the life of a startup or a business is not all roses all the time. Um, and consequently expect bad news occasionally. Um, so don't disappoint them. 
um, it's a great opportunity to deliver it. But when it's delivered in small doses, um, again, a lot better, a lot more palatable. It's a lot more palatable. But equally, they may ring you up and say, I saw that comment you made in your in your report. Um, I could help you with that. And that happens um, all the time, you know, and it, it just comes out of the blue. And sometimes those little things lead to, you know, lasting trust as well, which, um, you know, in addition to solving the problem can be very, very useful. So uh-huh. there's three things, you know, um, persistence, health, communication. And ask for help. That's the other one you gave and us. And ask for help. Exactly. <laughs> Fantastic. I urge you. When you're stuck or when you're not sure and you're a member of the Get Strategic Add an Expert program, ask for Rob. He will help. Thank you, Rob. You're welcome. You're unstoppable.